Hi, welcome back to Statistics. Um, today we're going to talk about a very important topic. We're going to talk about how to perform a z-test. Now a z-test is nothing more than a hypothesis test. We could be testing whether a mean is greater than a value. We could be testing whether a uh, proportion is greater than a given value or less than a given value. And we've done hypothesis tests in the past. Uh, we're going to follow all of the basic structure of the hypothesis test as we've designed it. We're going to need an alternative hypothesis. We're going to need a null hypothesis. We're going to try to figure out what that p-value is. And on the basis of the p-value, then we're going to figure out how to reject or not reject the null hypothesis. So that should be easy, right? Well, we're going to try to do this in a different way. And so instead of working with simulations and trying to produce these complicated computer programs that reproduce and churn through all of this data in order to figure out what the p-value is, we're going to see how to use the normal distribution as a model for what's really going on when we're resampling or when we're drawing that first sample from a population. We're going to use the normal distribution to understand, and then we're going to base our result of our test on the normal distribution. And that's what distinguishes the z-test from the previous kind of hypothesis test. But the good news is a lot of this is the same. We've got an alternative hypothesis that states that some, some mean is greater than some value or some mean is not equal to some value or some, pro some proportion is, is greater than a value or less than a value or unequal to value or it may state something even more complicated. It might say that the difference between two means is positive or the difference between two proportions is negative. And we've got a null hypothesis that says, you know, that it's zero usually, or that there's something is equal to something else. And we're gonna try to use a p-value to assess. So a lot of that is all the same, but the use of the normal distribution is gonna be the new added wrinkle here that really distinguishes the z-test from the prior work. So let me remind you about some stuff that you already know. First of all, the normal distribution is a perfect bell curve. It's a perfect bell curve that looks roughly like this. You can have a normal distribution with any given mean and any given standard deviation that you can imagine. The simplest one I can possibly draw is the normal bell curve with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. And that's what this funny notation means, n, zero, one. And it looks basically like this. Here's a distribution curve drawn for n, zero, one, which is the normal distribution with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. For this curve, it is absolutely perfectly true that 68%, well, within round off, 68% of the distribution lies within one standard deviation of the mean, 95% lies within two, and 99.7 lies within three standard deviations of the mean. So it's like the perfect and simplest distribution you could imagine. And the z-test is based on the expectation that this is probably a good model for what happens when we draw out a sample from a population and perform some sort of measurement on it. So that's what the normal distribution is all about. Standard error. Standard error next to p-value, these are two of the most tricky concepts. So what is standard error? And how does it compare to standard deviation? The standard deviation of a population tells you how much it varies from case to case to case. Standard error is how much variability you expect from sample and measurement to sample and measurement to sample and measurement. If you were to repeat the experiment again and again and again, how much variability would you get in the end result of the experiment? So if you're sampling 100 people to try to figure out what's the average weight of an American and getting an average out of that, then how much would that average tend to vary up and down, right? The, the weights of Americans will have a large standard deviation because people are a bit different and there is a lot of difference between people. But the average among 100 would not have nearly that much variability because all the variability, well, most of the variability would be washed away and we would get a very central value there. But there would still be some natural error even after sampling 100 and averaging them all. And the reason for that error is the randomness that, that is inherent to the sampling itself. It just causes a little bit of variability. And it's that variability, the variability of the final result of this sample, measure, and conclude, it's that variability which standard error is all about. If it were not for standard error, statistics would be super easy, right? Do one sample, get a result, hey, it's completely right. But that's not how the world is, um, and standard error is real, and so we have to account for it. We've already used standard error in really interesting ways. We've used standard error to produce confidence intervals, right? We get a measured value, and then 
maybe plus or minus twice the standard error from that measured value. And then that gives us our confidence interval that tells us the right result is probably within that confidence interval somewhere. And so that's a really important use of standard error. Today we're going to be using standard error to, to actually perform the hypothesis test using that. And the other like extremely tricky concept in stats is the concept of the p-value. The p-value is the probability of getting results that weird coincidentally. As always in a hypothesis test, we have two competing hypotheses. One is the alternative hypothesis, which is a statement of difference that we expect to prove, but we are not sure yet whether the data will support that. And one is the null hypothesis that says, actually, there's no, there's really nothing going on. There's nothing to see here. These things are equal. There's no effect. The, the null hypothesis just states no effect. Even if there were no effect, it is still possible to get a measured effect in the data. Why? Standard error. Because accidents happen. I mean, it's not, it's not accidents of human frailty, but it's, it's just accidental circumstances of the, the, the way the sample comes, because the sample is random. So just for random reasons, it's possible to measure some effect just for no reason at all, even if the null hypothesis is true and there's absolutely no real effect going on, it still is possible to measure a little bit of an effect. And the p-value is the probability of measuring an effect as strong as what you actually measured if the null hypothesis is really the truth in the matter. So we hope that the p-value is small, which says that that's far-fetched, improbable, which says that the null hypothesis is not credible, which says we can reject the null hypothesis and conclude, finally, that the alternative hypothesis is true. So that's how we use the p-value, and that's what the p-value is all about. So we're going to put all of these pieces of the puzzle together today to do our hypothesis test in which we're using the standard error and the normal distribution instead of re-simulation. So let's talk about an example. And I want the example to be simple and intuitive. So let's return to this traffic example. So let's say that you have a road and the speed limit along the road is 30 miles an hour. Now, if, if even one person is going faster than 30 miles an hour, then that's a problem because they're breaking the law. But if people on average are going faster than 30 miles an hour, then that might be an even bigger problem. And so the alternative hypothesis here is going to be that the average velocity, or let's just say speed, the average speed on the road whatever road, it doesn't matter which road, is greater than 30 miles per hour. And this is the kind of hypothesis that we could test by collecting some data. We're going to assume that we put a device out to measure the speed of people driving along the road and we collect some data. The null hypothesis here is going to be the contrary statement that the average speed, now this is not going to say less than or equal to, it's going to say that the average speed is exactly equal to 30 miles per hour. And notice that the average here is the population-wide average, which is mu. So this statement of the alternative hypothesis states mu is greater than 30. And this statement of the null hypothesis says mu is equal to 30, and we're going to let them fight it out. So how do we measure, how do we figure out which is right? Well, we collect some data. So let's assume that we collect some data. So we collect data, and um, of course, I'm not going to try to transcribe the data set onto the board, but let's just assume that we get some data, and from the data we can, we can calculate the, the average, that is the sample average, and the standard deviation, and both of which will be useful. So the sample average is x bar. That's how fast the people in the sample were driving on average. And I'm just going to make up some numbers here, but I kind of want to imagine that there might be a an effect which may or may not be significant. So let's say that the average in the sample is 34 miles per hour, which, so this is supposed to be like not quite sure. It is greater than 30, but it's not a slam dunk because it could be just a coincidence, right? Maybe it's just this sample. We can also collect from the data the standard deviation. And I wanna use some simple numbers here. So let's just say the standard deviation is five miles per hour, meaning, that yes, although people travel, people in the sample traveled on average 34 miles per hour, it was also normal for them to travel around about five miles per hour faster or slower than that. That's the natural variability here. Not knowing anything else than that, we would probably tend to assume that people are driving, that the speeds of people are distributed with a bell curve, a normal bell curve, um, 
with a, with a mean of 34 and a standard deviation of 5. But um, so one more thing that we need to know about this data is it's useful to know the sample size. If the sample size is 2, for example, then, I mean, what are we even doing? If the sample size is a million, then we've really got a whole lot of data here. Let's put the answer somewhere in between. Let's say n equals 100. So use, the use of the symbol n means that has to be the sample size, not, the, not of course, the population size. So here we have some data, and the data supports the alternative hypothesis, but we're not quite sure whether it supports it enough. We're not quite sure whether there uh, might be just a coincidence, uh, whether the data could be just a coincidence. So I think what's useful to do here is um, let's write down a null story, okay? So not just a null hypothesis, but a story of what happened and why. Um, and so what I'm going to write down is I'm going to put myself completely within the mindset of the null hypothesis. And I'm going to say, this is what happened from my perspective. So, right, this is, in a way, I'm maybe playing devil's advocate right here because um, we intended to prove that the alternative hypothesis was true. But now I'm putting myself completely within the mindset of the null hypothesis. And I'm going to try to explain what happened. So what can we explain? So the null hypothesis story is the actual mu is 30. Now, so it is actually 30, right? That's, that's the story of the null hypothesis. That's not the only thing that I can predict using the null hypothesis. So x bar was likely to be um, 30, right? <laughs> the, the most likely outcome for x bar was that it would end up to be 30. But x bar was subject to standard error. Now here, in the case, in the null story, that's not the only thing we can say. Yes, x bar should have some standard error, and we would expect to have some variability. But that's not the only thing we can say about the standard error. We can actually calculate what that standard error was in order to predict how much variability x bar should have exhibited, right? So this is imagining that, like, these are things that you could have said even before you collected the data. You could say, I'm going to collect some data, and I, I convince myself that the average is actually 30, and then I know that when I collect the data, I should expect to get an answer of 30, but I also know that it's going to be subject to a little bit of variability. And then the key question here is how much? Well, the answer is standard error. That's what the standard error is, right? And the great news is we have a formula for the standard error. The standard error, actually we have two and we have to use the right one, right? So we have a formula for the standard error of a mean, and we have a different formula for the standard error of a proportion. And so this is a mean, right, x bar, and it's an average speed. So, so this is a mean, so we'll use the standard error of the mean. And that formula is sigma over root n, which we are kind of sort of in a position to use here, uh, but kind of sort of not. So, um, uh, so working ahead here, so, so if the formula is sigma over root n, then we know n is 100, and we know sigma sort of is 5, except this is actually the s here, which is the sample standard deviation, but it's the closest thing we have to knowing sigma, and so we're going to plug that in. So that's going to be 5 over uh, the square root of 100, which is, I rigged the numbers, so that's just 5 over 10, so that's 1 half. And I'm having trouble getting markers that work. Let's switch to another one. Um, so x bar was subject to the standard error, and so x bar, here's where I'm going to start invoking the normal distribution, x bar should have been distributed normally with a mean of 30 and a standard deviation of 1 half. So basically what I'm saying here is that x bar before we even carry out the experiment, should have been distributed normally with a center of 30 and a standard deviation a, and, a, and a variability of 1 half, right? And the variability of x bar is the standard error because it's the variability in the final result as opposed to the variability in, you know, from one data point to another. So this is the null story and it describes what should have been expected. 
And now we see what was actually happened was that we got an x-bar 34. Is 34 consistent with this? Well, yes and no. Um, it's in fact, um, it, it's in fact quite remarkable um, with respect to this, but we can't really know that before we calculate how it relates to this distribution. And this is the key new concept. What we're going to do, so now that we have this null story, what we're going to do is we're going to calculate how far x bar, the, the actual x bar was from our expectations. And this is called the z-score. The idea of the z-score is to calculate how far the measurement was from your anticipated value of the measurement in the right units. So, um, so we're going to subtract. We're going to subtract 34, the actual measurement, minus 30. And we're going to get 4, but that's not actually the z-score, not yet. That 4 is how far it was on an absolute sense, but we actually want to know how, min how far it was compared to the anticipated variability here, which was only a half a unit. And so what we're going to do is we're going to divide by that half here, and that's going to give us 4 over a half, which is 8. So what we see here, it, so what we're doing is we're measuring, we're asking ourselves, we've got a measured value of x bar, 34, and an anticipated value of x bar, namely 30, and we know how much variability we expected to see in x bar, which was a half a unit. So how many half units off are we? That's basically what we're asking. So how do we figure out how many half units off we are? Well, you count from 30 to 34 by units of a half unit, right? So in other words, you subtract and then you divide by a half. So that gives you eight. There are eight, eight half units from 30 to 34. And that means that we have basically, so if the null story is true, we can continue the null story. So we have landed eight um, units from the expectation. So from the expectation. And that's just another way of saying z equals 8. So that's what z is. It's how far away from the anticipated value you are, but measured in units of how much variability you anticipate. So we've landed 8 units from the expectation, z equals 8. And OK, so varying 8 times more than anticipated is probably pretty unlikely, right? We need to figure out what is the probability of that. So um, it's a little bit off my chart here. We look at the standard normal distribution, centered at 0 with 1 unit, and then we just go out and find an 8 here. And we ask ourselves, how much of the variability is beyond that 8? And we see, oh, well, in order to answer that, we just need to know how much area there is here. This distribution is designed so that the total amount of area is 1 or 100%, and we need to measure how much area there is there. And we get an answer like 0.00000001. In other words, a tiny, tiny answer. And that total area is measuring something very important. It's measuring how the total probability of getting eight units or more outside of the expected value, which is just the p-value, right? So that area is actually indicating the p-value. As long as you can calculate how big that area is, then you know the p-value. The interesting thing here is that we're calculating an area on the standard normal distribution by using the z-score, which gives us something that we can compare against the standard normal distribution. And that means that you only need to be able to calculate the area on the standard normal distribution. You don't need to create an actual normal distribution centered at 30 with a standard deviation of 1 half in order to make this work. And that means that, you know, if you want to design tools to make this easy, they can be tools that work on the standard, that only work for the standard normal distribution. Now, 8 is way, way outside the, the norm of the normal distribution, so it's really a very strong result. I want to indicate how things would change here if we had, um, if we had much less data, um, because if we had much less data, then we would get a, 
a very different outcome here. So um, without uh, so uh, without complicating things too much, what I want to do is I want to change the value of n here. So um, I'm going to change n so that the standard deviation will change, and I want it to be um, what do I want it to be? So I want n to be I think. Four. <laughs> Let's just set it to be four. So this is a really miserable data set at this point, right? So if I have only four um, measurements, then suddenly my average of 34 seems a lot less important. And your intuition should be, if you perform this same study with only four measurements, then your conclusion should be much weaker. And so let's see what, what happens, what changes. We could still get the average value of 34 miles per hour. That could still happen. We could still get a standard deviation of 5 miles per hour. That could still happen. But if n is 4, well, some things change in our null story. The null story says the actual mean is 30. x bar was likely to be 30. That's all still true. x bar was subject to some standard error, but now things change. The standard error is sigma over the square root of n, but the square root of n is now the square root of 4 instead of the square root of 100. And so this gives us the square root of 4, which is 2. So we get 5 over 2, which is 2.5. And that means that x bar should have been normal with a mean of 30 and a variability of 2.5. And that, that huge, that explosion of standard error is really a, a reflection of the fact that you're going to get a lot more just random error if your sample size is tiny than you will if your sample size is nice and big. Okay, so now we need to figure out how many units we are from anticipated. We're still four units away, but now we're four compared with an anticipated variability of 2.5. And so that's 4 over 2.5, which is 8 over 5, which is 1.6. Now, 1.6 is a lot less impressive. It still is actually, you know, something, um, but it's a lot less impressive. So um, where is that on this chart? If 2 is about here, then 1.6 is about here. Now. Here, what happened was we landed 1.6 units from the expected value. So z equals 1.6. How would this change our hypothesis test? Well, if you get a z value of 1.6, the key question is, all right, what is the probability of getting a z value that high or higher? So we look to the standard normal distribution, which is our perfect model of a bell curve, and we find 1.6, and we explore, OK, how big is the area to the right of that? The area to the right of that represents all possible events where we would just randomly happen to get a z value of 1.6 or higher. That is, this is all the events where we would just randomly get an effect this extreme just as an accident, even though the actual average was 30. So, um, so how likely is that? Remember that the total area is 1 for 100%. And when we calculate this area, we're basically measuring the p-value. So if we actually go to 1.6 here, and later I'll show you how to do this, we get 0.054 of the area there underneath that curve. And that means that basically a little more than 5% of the time, you would get a result like this just randomly. Even under these assumptions, you would get a result like this just randomly, um, even if the null hypothesis were true, about 5.4% of the time. So that is the p-value. So that's the p-value. Now, what do we do with the p-value of 0.054? It's actually pretty close. I mean, that's actually pretty close to underneath the alpha threshold, but not quite. And that means that we will resolve the hypothesis in the normal way. We'll compare the p-value to the alpha value, 
which standard choice is 0.05. And in this case, it is not less than that alpha value. And so we will fail to reject the null hypothesis. And so um, the conclusion here of this study with uh, an N of four, the conclusion will be we do not reject the null hypothesis. And when we do not reject the null hypothesis, what that means is we do not end up with a definitive conclusion. So we can't conclude um, that the average speed is greater than 30. It might be greater than 30. We have some indication that it is greater than 30, but we can't conclude with statistical significance that the average speed is greater than 30. So to sum up here, what distinguishes this from the normal way we've done hypothesis tests so far is that we're using a normal distribution to produce a story about what would happen in the null hypothesis. And then we're using a z value to basically measure how weird is our data? How crazy is our data? How off is our data compared to our expectations? But the formula for the z value is really kind of cool. We take the measured and we subtract the null expectation and then we divide by the standard error. And that is basically asking us, how many standard errors off are we, right? Basically, you want to think of dividing by the standard error as a unit conversion. Convert to units of standard error. And this z-score is actually telling you, how many standard errors off are we? If we're three standard errors off, then that's a big deal, and z is three. If we're five standard errors off, then that's a huge deal, and z is five. If we're only 1.6 standard errors off, then apparently that's not a big enough deal. In order to figure out how big of a deal it is, you need to take the, the z value that you've got and ask how probable is, is it to get randomly that z value or something more extreme, which is calculating the area of the right tail of this graph. So we'll use some online tools to do that in the short term. Um, but the z value becomes the critical tool by which we make the decision about, uh, the z-score the, the, becomes the critical value that helps us calculate the p-value, and then the p-value helps us resolve the hypothesis test. Now, this has been an example for a mean. We've done this whole thing to calculate a mean, namely the average speed on the road. Now, it's basically the same game for a proportion, but I want to do that to show you, you know, it's nice to have more than one example. And so in the next video, we're going to do exactly the same thing, but we're going to measure a proportion and do a hypothesis test for comparing a, a proportion against a baseline, and that'll be what we do next.